We're just getting our smoker going. We want nice, cool smoke. I may as well smoke my hands while I'm at it, just to mask my own pheromones. We're going to be doing live Q&A while we're doing a brood inspection. So if you've got questions, put them in the comments and we'll get to answering those. I'm just going to put some nice, cool smoke in the front of the hive, which will have a calming effect on the bees. A few puffs in the entrance and away we go. Now, we're not worried about fire here at the moment because we've had lots of rain, but if it was the dry time, you will need to look up whether you're allowed to light smokers or not. But here I'm just going to rest it on the ground. If it is dry in your area, rest it on a metal lid like this, which you smoker in when you put it away afterwards. So just for the purposes, I'll put that smoker right on the metal lid in front of the hive and while it drifts a little bit of smoke around the entrance it uh, continues that calming effect on the bees. Next I'm going to just put on my bee suit. Sometimes I forget but if you've got friendly bees you can get away with that kind of thing. If you've got uh, aggressive bees you'll soon know about it. So zip up in the middle then make sure you do these two side zips and this is the uh, ventilated jacket which is probably my favorite thing to wear because it's just really nice in these hot summer days with the the breeze blowing through it okay so next we're going to take off the roof of the hive now there's these little wing screws we did have them done up recently because we had 100 kilometer an hour winds up this slope so i'll make sure they're undone and We'll just take that roof off, which will just make the box a little lighter to lift when we lift off the super. Having a quick look in here, I can see this won't be too heavy because we're not seeing any. And on the other side, a handle. Let's just pry the boxes apart with your J tool. This is the tool that comes with our suits and jacket kits. So I'm putting it in. It doesn't really matter whether you go above or below the excluder. I'm going to go above and just loosening it up on all the corners. Sometimes it can be very firmly stuck if you haven't been into the hive for a while. They'll stick it together with their propolis and they work hard to free the boxes up. So this is uh, ready to go now. And what I'm gonna do is steady myself. And I'm gonna rock it back towards me and I'm going to lift with the box in the easier direction, which is where the weight is closer to you. So yeah, hands on the long sides, front and back. And if the box is really heavy, you might need to get some help. What I'm going to do is just put it down over here. I'm going to lean it up against the edge of the garden so any bees underneath don't get squashed if I put it straight down on the ground. Okay, today we're doing live Q&A, so if you've got questions, put them in the comments and away we go. So I'm looking at this hive here. At first glance, it's looking nice and healthy. There's a good amount of bees, they're starting to build burr comb on the excluder here. I'm not seeing any aggressive temperaments, so I'm gonna continue without my gloves on. If you're new to beekeeping, wear your gloves until you really get familiar with the, uh, the kind of attitude that your bees have. Some bees are sting first, ask questions later, and others are nice and calm to work with. And that genetics is determined by the queen's own genetics and the males she mates with in the first week of her life. Getting the smoker going again. And I'm just gonna add a little now to the top. Notice the tones changing. You can hear the buzz. And then it settles down again. And once it's settled, that's the time to take off the excluder. I'm going to do that 
nice and carefully just by peeling it off slowly like this. Use your J tool if you need to. There we go. Have a quick look on the underneath in case the queen happens to be there. You want to try not to orphan her from the hive because sometimes she can't find her way back in again. Just in case, you can lean that right up against the hive so that if she did happen to be there, she could simply uh, walk her way back in as she may not be able to fly very well. However, I have seen laying queens fly, so a lot of the things you hear in beekeeping aren't necessarily gospel, and you'll find that you'll see examples as you beekeep that'll go against the things that are written in the books. Okay, so I'm just looking down now, looking for an opportunity to, to take a frame out. Now we've got some space on here, these um, eight frame boxes which go with our flow six, have a generous amount of space on the edge and that's going to help us right now when we're prying this frame apart. You can see a bit of burr comb down between the frames and if I can go sideways first that'll just simply break. So there we go and that will save us from uh, getting down there and tediously pulling apart the burr comb. If you just lift when there's burr comb there bees will get scraped and comb will get damaged so it's that first frame that's the hardest you want to get a little bit of space first if you can or choose a frame that doesn't have much burr comb so we're lifting up and having a look what we have on this frame so typically you get honey on the outer edges of the hive and that's what we're seeing here a lot of honeycomb in fact you could cut out a section here if you wanted to take that away, enjoy that with your family and the bees will simply fill it back in. Because we're using a foundationless frame you can cut anywhere, you can cut a big shape out and the bees will fill it back in in a, in a few days usually. And the other side too is also showing all honeycomb. Look at that, a beautiful frame of honey. Some nice stores for the bees to to use when they're raising their brood. And lucky for us, they store more than they need often and we can share some too. Beautiful, so I'm going to just lean that up against the edge of the hive in case the queen happens to be on this frame. I'll have a quick look for her because it's fun to practice your queen spotting. Not that we necessarily need to find the queen every time. One thing that's interesting here they're using this for honey and they've sized the cells at about six millimeters, which is the, about the size we have in our flow frames also. When they're away from the brood nest and they don't plan to use the cells for brood, they will make bigger cells. And they'll go even bigger if they plan to lay drones in them. Whereas the normal size cell is about 5.3 millimeters and that's for raising all of those worker bees and the dual purpose, you, they'll use that for honeycomb also. Now I forgot my uh, shelf brackets here that can be used as a nice frame rest, so I'm just going to lean that frame up against the edge of the hive. Okay, we're going across ways now with the next frame and we're just going to be digging deeper into the brood box. Meanwhile, have we got some questions coming in? We do, Cedar. We've got one from Big Swall on YouTube. Is it okay for a new bee to operate just one hive? I've been told that five to six is best, but I don't want that much of a commitment, especially if I'm a horrible beekeeper. It's certainly fun to have more hives, but a lot of people just start with one and build up from there, and that's a perfectly fine thing to do. I would say two is better than one, because if, if you lose in one you can use the resources from the other some eggs on frames they can raise a queen from and you can get that hive going that's gone queenless so having two hives is always better but um, starting with one is also a good idea it's just to whet your appetite to see what it's all about to experience the joy of harvesting your own honey and looking after these amazing uh, insects that are such a big part of, of humans and their agriculture. So um, I would 
say um, you don't certainly don't need five to start. I would get started with one or two and take it from there. Okay. We have a, another question from A Must. Is it okay to use plastic frames in your hive? Certainly is. So there's a, a long uh, convention in beekeeping of of using foundation in frames. This is a foundationless frame where we've just let the bees draw it naturally from the comb guide. And that's one thing I like to do because it saves that work of putting in the wax and wire. Plastic foundation, I find personally, the bees uh, are quite resistive to. And I've got foundation that has been in the hive at the edge of, of, uh, of the second box. And it's been sitting there and I haven't finished drawing it and it's been years now. So it's a bit harder to get them to use the plastic foundation, but if they've got no choice, they will get in and start using it. And beekeepers will have their preference. And it doesn't matter, you can mix it up in the box if you want to use some plastic foundation, some wax foundation, and some foundationless, by all means do. You'll learn a lot as you go, and you'll find out what works for you and your bees. So we're looking at this frame, and I just put my finger on a bee, so I'm going to have to get the sting out. Sorry about that, will be. If you have a look here, so you've got to be careful not to place your finger on a bee. And just to get that out, I'm going to scrape sideways. And the reason why you do that is you don't want to, if you, if you have a look at that um, stinger there, I'll just put it on my nail, it's still got the poison gland right on the back of the um, stinger. There's like a little tiny, uh, stinger point you can see and then there's a little sac and that sac you can actually still see it pulsing and that pulsing is it trying to put more venom into you so if you squeeze that more venom will go into your finger if you scrape sideways you'll get a bit less so it's a nice technique if you want to look up beekeeping first page you've got links on each of our pages wow that's amazing it's still pulsing away going to flick that away now. So um, if you're wearing gloves you'll get a few stings. If you're not wearing gloves you'll sometimes get a few stings on your hand especially if you're a bit distracted and you put your finger right onto a bee. They don't appreciate that very much. The tone of the hive isn't, um, I'm not seeing it as aggressive it's simply just I put my finger in the wrong spot. So some people say it's good to add a bit of smoke to the sting area so that so the smell of that sting doesn't set off uh, other bees. You can do that now. And every now and then if you give your smoker a good puff, it keeps it going. So when you need it, it's there for you. So Luke Dennis has a great question. Hi Cedar, I have lots of drones in my hive. Still got eggs and capped worker brood. I have a lot of drone brood. Can I remove remove or damage some of the drone brood to eliminate drones? Okay, so there is some beekeepers who like to smash down drone brood because they would rather have worker brood. But I would say don't do that, let the bees sort it out. If you've got um, a situation where they're laying lots of drone brood, then, then changing the queen will be a better idea than trying to manipulate what she lays. So if you have a look here, you can see a drones, drones just hatching from the cells. There's a drone there that's just hatched. You can tell by the way it's light and fluffy. And you can see these ones are just chewing their way out of the cells. You've got one, two, three, four drones. Five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> Amazing. What a um, on-topic show we're having here with these drones just poking their heads out for the first time. So they're an important part of sharing the genetics around it. And it's certainly, um, you don't want to go just smashing down your own cells all the time. Um, so if you have a look, um, you can pick up the drones. They don't actually have stingers, so they're a good one to um, share around with the family there. And that drone has just emerged, by the way, it's fluffy like that. And um, yeah, so if you're gonna hand a bee to a child to hold, don't hand them a worker bee, hand them a drone and explain that they don't have a stinger. So, isn't that beautiful? Watching all of these little heads poke up out of the cells for the first time. Here's one. They brush these worker bees away. There we go. 
can see all of those heads. Isn't that cool? Alison has like. a question. So can you... Can Give us any tips on how to tidy up brood box that has some excess brood cones, sorry, burr cones sticking on top of the frames, on the lid and on the edges of the box. And do you have any suggestions for what to place the super on whilst inspecting the brood box? So you can certainly just scrape off any burr comb on top of the frames and I'll show you how to do that in a second. The, um, if you have a look at the difference between worker brood, which is here, and drone brood, which is here, the drones stick right out of the comb face like a bit of a bullet shape. So um, that's you can get your eye in pretty quickly. Worker brood, drone brood, and then honey up here looks different again. Slightly translucent, tapping on it um, with the honey. So in, in order to, to tidy up, some beekeepers like to keep things whistle clean and others don't. And I'll explain the theories behind it as well. But in order to scrape off this burr comb, you can do it while the frames are still in the hive or you can do it while you're holding it. But basically you use your smoker to, to get the bees away and then you use your hive tool to simply scrape off that burr comb. So I'm going to do that now just by adding a bit of smoke to that area. The bees um, will react by, first of all, getting a bit um, agitated by the smoke but then with any luck they'll clear off the top of the frames and then you see an opportune moment when they're not there just to scrape down the frame like this and that removes that burr comb and keeps it all nice and tidy which makes it a bit easy to, easier to pull off the excluder for next time but others like to leave it there and say it's a bit of a reservoir and the bees will move wax around and use it as a resource so it's up to you it doesn't really matter which way you go your bees will be fine Jessica asks do you have to do this with the frames or can you get the honey from the hive and not have to mess with the frames the question again do you have to do this with the frames or can you get the honey without messing with the frames in other words do you have to inspect the hive ah I see um, great question the answer is yes um, caring for bees, if you don't want to do your brood inspections, you'll need to get somebody else to do it for you. If you simply want to hive in your yard and you want to harvest honey from it, then um, there's an obligation to look after the bees, make sure there's no pests and diseases in the hive, which means routine brood inspections, getting in there, looking at the frames and checking uh, on the health of the hive. Now, there's a learning curve that goes along with that and it's an amazing thing. Often people are a bit daunted by the process, but after a bit they're addicted to the process because it's this amazing new world you're exploring right from your backyard. Now, if, um, if you don't want to do that, then you would need to strike up a relationship with a beekeeper who will come and do that for you and look after your brood nest and make sure pests and diseases aren't uh, present in your brew box. Okay. So I'm adding a little bit more smoke again just to where I want to work so I don't squash any bees. Meanwhile, if you've got more questions, put them in the comments. Jog would like to know, can you harvest all year round in Australia? So where we are, you actually can harvest all year round because we're in a subtropical region which is nice and warm in the winter time also. However, a lot of places have a long cold winter where you wouldn't be harvesting just before winter because you'd be wanting to leave stores for them and you wouldn't be harvesting in the winter time. You'll be harvesting when they bring the honey in in the spring and summer. Look at that, we've got beautiful um, uh, brood here. And you see a lot of brood across the frame. You can tell there's going to be a lot of bees emerging from this cell soon and there's going to be a population explosion in this hive which really help for going foraging and bringing in the honey and the nectar the nectar to, to make honey and the pollen to, to make their bee bread and that'll really make the hive uh, take off and perform well so this is a really good sign when you're seeing brood all across the frame like this look at that it's a Okay, 
Let's have a look what's going on on the other side again, covered in brood. So thousands of new bees waiting to emerge there. They spent 11 days in their capped phase. Here's a worker bee that's, no, that's a, um, a drone that's just emerged. We were looking at that earlier. They're a bit whiter. There's a, there's a worker bee that's just emerged. It's moving in, in wobbly kind of steps across the, the, the frame. It's a little bit whiter and uh, lighter in color, a little bit more furrier. And um, it's taking its first steps in the hive now. Bliptane from YouTube has a question. I plan on having two hives, but have a concern when it comes to splitting. Will they make queen cells annually? If so, do I just destroy them to avoid splits or do I have to add more hives? Okay, it's a good question. So we also had a question last week, similar, um, that came in after the live about queen cells and what to do and whether they're supersedure or whether they're swarm cells. So let's talk about queen cells for a moment. I'm not seeing any on this frame. I'll pull out the next frame in case we get a, a nice example from the bees. But basically, bees will often be raising a queen um, or, or multiple queens. So if the hive gets really populated and that uh, colony wants to swarm, they will start to raise what's called swarm cells, which are just queen cells that they're purposefully making to raise more queens so they can divide the colony. So the swarm cells, you'll see around the extremities of the frame, you'll see them down here at the bottom. Usually, so usually bees won't always do what um, you hope they would do, or, or what the book said. Um, I'm seeing a bit of drone, on, drone brood on this one. This area here, I'm not seeing a queen cell yet. But what they look like, queen cells, um, they look more like a peanut shell, and if they're around the bottom, they can be a, a, a little bit smaller sometimes. And if they're raising lots of those, then they're probably getting ready to swarm. If they're a supersedious cell, which they will normally draw from a worker cell that's already got an egg in it. So if there's an egg down a cell, the bees have to then draw it out from more the, uh, where the brood's laid in the centre of the comb and they'll draw it out and down like a, a peanuts, uh, peanut shell from the, the main frame. So the ones you see in the main frame area are uh, normally supersedia. They've, they've had an issue with the queen and they need to raise a new one. With the swarm cells they make the cups first, then the queen lays the egg in there and then the, uh, the queens are raised from that in order to swarm. Now some beekeepers like to get in there and smash off all the swarm cells as a method of swarm prevention. As a beginner beekeeper, I would say don't do that. If you're not 100% sure of what you're doing, don't go smashing off the queen cells. Leave it up to the bees, they know what they're doing. As you get more experience, you can experiment with techniques like that. Now, the uh, best method for swarm prevention is get onto it early in the early spring and give the bees some space to lay new eggs. And that means putting some fresh frames for them to build home and lay eggs. A couple of frames, one perhaps here and one perhaps here. And you can do that simply by cutting out some of the honey on the edge and moving that frame to the centre or swapping it for an already prepared frame that you want to swap it out for. And that'll release that, uh, that overcrowded um, trigger of the bees preparing to swarm. So that's the best thing to do. So getting right back to your question, which is, I've got lots of swarm cells, should I be hacking them off or making new queens? I don't really. So yes, you can make more hives by moving the frames with the 
the queen cells or the capped queen cells on them so that they're, they're, they're um, they're not a queen cup, but they're a queen cell. There's an actual queen about to emerge. Then you can move that into a new hive and make a split. If you don't want to do that, yes, it's an advanced thing. You can actually cut them off, but you want to be careful. And make sure you've got a good laying queen before you go cutting off the queen cells they're raising. Well, that was a long answer, but um, it's quite a, quite a big topic and it's an extraordinary part of the honeybee world is the way they raise their queens. Cedar, with the, um, the bees, it's a little bit hard to hear you clearly, so speak up a bit more if you can. Cedar, maybe you can bump your mic. Pull it out and the cluster. Okay, we've got an issue with volume here. Um, are you sure it's coming through the mic? Yeah, it's fine, it's just a bit uh, quiet. Okay. And the bees are quite loud. The bees are loud. We're just going to turn the volume up. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me louder now. Um, but hopefully that's better. We have another question uh, from Tizza. I have done a split from my original hive and there seems to be three queen cells. Is this common? Three queen cells? Yeah. Okay, that is common. They'll often raise more than one queen cell, which is good because they want to make sure they've got a, a queen to get going when you've made a split. So let them work it out, let them fight it out. The reigning queen will take over. Three is a great result, none's a poor result, and you'll have to start again. So <laughs> let the bees raise their, their queens and decide who's going to be the one laying eggs in the hive. Okay, some great questions today. We're going to continue looking through this hive and do our routine brood inspection. We're checking for pests and diseases we go looking for sunken dark uh, capping, making sure we've got uh, worker brood in there so we know we have a laying queen. A laying queen is important. If you don't have one of those, your hive will slowly dwindle unless they have the resources to raise a new queen. We're going to be doing it gently. We certainly don't want to get into a situation where we accidentally roll a whole lot of bees and squash the queen, which is why we um, that effort in the beginning to moving gently sideways first. So here we can see lots of worker brood which is great. And we had a question about cycling frames out of the brood nest. So if they've been used for multiple seasons by the bees to raise a lot of young, they actually get quite dark. Now this isn't very dark yet but they'll go black after a while and they'll be um, just to, to relieve the pathogen load, it's good to cycle those frames out, give them some fresh comb to work with. Now there's a few techniques you can do to cycle the, the comb out of the hive. Now, the, what you want to do is move the old dark ones towards the edge of the hive. So we can do that with this one, even though it's not that dark yet. And um, then it will slowly, as all the brood emerges and they fill it with honey, become a frame of honey. Once it's a frame of honey, you can pull that right out of the hive and away, uh, and then you've got space to add a new frame back into the center and all the frames move over. So you certainly don't just want to take that frame out and go away, because what will happen is um, that brood here will die if they're not part of the hive. So to avoid that, you move it to the edge first, let the bees fill it with honey, and then take that frame out. If it's a foundationless frame like this, you can cut the, uh, the comb right out in If it was all honey, cut it right out, take that away, and put the frame straight back in. One of the benefits of using foundationless frames if you've got wax and wire, you'll have to take it away for re-waxing. Okay, I'm noticing the bees are getting a little bit antsy to my uh, hands. We're going to give them a little bit more smoke. Looking for any sunken dark cappings, which could be a sign of AFB or EFB, and any piercing marks. 
not seeing any which is good. Everything's looking happy and healthy in this heart. We have a question from Tim. My five frame nuke seems to be going well in the flow brood box. Bees have packed out one empty frame, but two still remain empty. Should I supplement with more protein or do I just need to be patient? So was that the flow frames or the brood frames? The nuke. The nuke, okay. Um, in my area, I don't feed anything to the bees because there's always some kind of forage, even if it's not a whole lot. But in other areas, people find there's a lot of times where they just don't quite have enough pollen to collect or quite have it enough um, nectar to, to really get the hive going and they will feed pollen cakes or uh, sugar syrup. So it's up to you. I would ask that question to your local beekeepers. Around here, I wouldn't bother. I'd just let the bees naturally build. Jason has a great question. How long do you wait after finding your hive is queenless, but with three to four queen cells, before inspecting again? How long do you wait after finding your hive queenless? But you're finding three to four queen cells. Uh, but you've got three to, to make sure it's successful. If there's, um, I see. So if there's queen cells in there and they're actually capped, then you, ha you have a success there because the hive has successfully raised a new queen. From that point, um, the, it's a 16 day cycle from eggs to the queen emerging, so you'll be part way through that if you're seeing the capped queen cell. Now, from there, it's going to be um, somewhere, uh, could be up to a month before you're seeing eggs. The reason being is you could get some bad weather and it could take a while for her to get her mating flights in. She'll normally go for a mating flight or two and it's only once she's mated that she'll come back and start laying. So if you, if you check in three or four weeks then, and you don't have any sign of eggs at all, then you need to get back in there and check in another week's time to, to make sure you've got those laying um, eggs, that, that laying queen in there, and eggs, and the process of raising the young has started. So, um, so that's uh, about the time frame. If there isn't any cap cells and they're actually queen cups, they're just a cup and there's no capping, then have a close look at the edge of that queen cup. If it's torn, then one uh, queen has recently emerged from it. If it's nice and neat on the edge, then it is empty. And have a look down that cell and see if you can see a um, egg or a young larvae in the bottom of the cell. If you've just got cups with nothing in them and the uh, edge is nice and neat, then it, you need to check back in um, uh, earlier because they may not have gotten it together to raise a queen at all and you may need to rectify the situation by providing some a frame of eggs from another hive or buying in a new queen. Angela asks, I'll be checking my brood boxes for the first time today. Any advice and when do I know to put the super on? Okay, so fantastic. You're going for your first brood inspection. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. So my advice would be um, if you're feeling really nervous, get someone who's done it before to, to be there with you. Um, take a look at, at our videos like this one. And also we've got the beekeeper.org, which is in-depth training from experts around the world, taking you right through from square one through to being uh, having a deep scientific knowledge of beekeeping and also a practical knowledge of beekeeping. So, so um, but in terms of, of, I would say, get in there and go for it. Make sure you protect yourself. You don't want to have an experience that's, that's um, a bit scary first. So put your gloves on. Make sure you've got a good bee seat. Get your smoker going. Give, give them three good puffs of smoke in the entrance. Wait a couple of minutes for them to calm down. Then lift the lid off. And also choose a day that's um, a nice, calm, sunny day. Mid-morning to mid-afternoon the best because a lot of them are out foraging and, and uh, busy working rather than waiting for intruders. <laughs> so um, there's some, some good advice. And also don't feel like you have to do everything at once on your first food inspection. If you get the lid off 
and you're able to pull a frame out and marvel at that beautiful world of bees and put it back again, then that's a great first step. Great to hear you getting into it. Matthew has a great question. I get a lot of trouble with wax moths. Any tips on how to keep their numbers down? Okay, so wax moth feed on wax and they'll only do that outside the hive unless your hive's really weak. Inside the hive the bees won't allow any wax moth to take hold. So that, that means if you've taken some wax frames out or flow frames out, they've got wax on them and they're sitting around in the shed, the wax moth will then feed on that wax and uh, make a mess of those frames and potentially a mess of the woodware. They can sometimes chew right into the woodware. So what you'll need, that need to do if you've got um, that situation is cut out all of that comb that's uh, affected. The flow frames won't be affected. All you need to do is brush the wax moth off and they're good to go again. The, the frames that are affected, you can, you can cut all the wax off and let the bees start again with that and uh, try and store them away from wax moth in a sealed container or in a freezer. If you've got wax moth building up um, underneath your hive, then simply clear the wax away. If you've got a whole lot of um, debris in your tray, just clean it out. If there's no wax in there, the wax moth can't live in that area. Okay. Some people are reporting problems with ants and I'd like to know what the best recommendation is for that and also just general pest management and prevention. Okay, the ants are an issue for humans because they're unsightly, but they're not actually an issue for the bees. The bees will keep ants out of the hive always, and when a few fall in when you're lifting the lid or whatever, you'll see them really, um, really kick those ants out, and they, they get into big tussles. Um, but however, they can be annoying when you're getting behind the, um, behind the window covers and things like that. So what you'll need to do if you want to get rid of those ants is brush them away from behind the window covers and then you'll need to create a bit of a barrier so they don't keep walking back onto the hive. If you've got foliage up against the hive like this, you need to trim it away or the bees will just walk up the foliage and then you can use the leg bolts on the flow hive too as a barrier simply by putting some grease around them and the ants won't walk over them. I'd recommend a white grease like a Vaseline, that way it just doesn't mark um, things so much and that will provide a bit of a barrier. Other people use cups of, of water and things like that you can experiment with but generally if you brush the ants away and get rid of them a few times they find a new home and the problem goes away for some time. Peter, okay. Alice has one quick question. Can you demonstrate the technique for inspecting both sides of the foundationless frame safely? Okay great, good question. So when the, the frame is well built, if I pick up this frame here, when that frame is well built and connected to the sides and even the bottom, it's, um, you can tip that over any way you like and it won't fall out. But when it's fresh, and particularly if it's heavy with honey, you'll get this beautiful arc of comb in here. But in that phase, it's very, fragile to tipping sideways and you'll learn quite quickly because it's uh, a bit sad when a big fresh piece of comb falls out of a hive that's just getting started. So um, if, you, if you accidentally tip it up like that and you see the honey moving just tip it straight back again and that will um, stop that from breaking off. Now um, if you want to check both sides of the frame you don't have to do any fancy techniques it's just simply turning the frame around and keeping it on its axis. You can leave it, you can put it up against the hive like that, swap your hands around, and then you're looking at the other side of the frame. People do use fancy techniques of, of tipping it over like that. And then yeah, you can look at it upside down without going through that more demanding phase on the comb structure by uh, tipping it that way. Just once again, if you want to do uh, techniques to look at that side, if you're looking at this side, then you can roll it around, spin it on its axis, and then you're looking at the other side.
If you've got foundation in the frames or wax and wire, you won't need to do that because the frame, the comb won't be so delicate. And once it's built out to the edges, you can go ahead and tip it on its side. Todd asks, is it too late in the Australian season to populate a flow hive? It depends where you are, so um, and it depends what method of populating your flow hive you're planning to do. So, if um, we're still in our summer here, so I would say uh, generally no, you can populate a hive this time of year, and the bees will get on their feet and get going. If you're in the far south here in the colder regions, then you might want to to delay a bit and get going in the springtime. But um, everywhere else you can populate in the summer, no problem. We're still doing a lot of splits now, and it's a good time to um, populate new hives. Now, if it was a bit later and you're in the autumn, then um, you probably wouldn't be populating new hives if you're in the, the cooler regions. But again, in this subtropical area, you could um, take uh, splits even in the winter time. But that's a bit of an anomaly because we're in the subtropics. Um, so it really depends, you can ask your local beekeepers to get local knowledge of what, uh, whether it's um, time to start a new hive or not. Of course if you're just taking a whole box of bees like this and transferring them to your flow hive, then you can do that at any time of year. They're already a going concern, they've already got lots of stores. Having said that, the extreme cold regions you'll need to have even more stores than what they have in a single box to get them through the winter so you may need to then feed them to get another box of stores happening prior to the winter so there's never one answer in beekeeping and the best knowledge is local knowledge so by all means ask around Leanne asks an interesting question can I shine a torch into the cell for inspection or would the bright light hurt the bees the bright light won't hurt the bees. You can certainly shine a torch in and look down into the bottom of the cells and look for those eggs that you're probably looking for. Or you can just get the, uh, the angle to the sun right, bearing in mind if it's new delicate comb, you want to be careful tipping it over. But you're looking for that sunlight to shine down the cell and illuminate that little egg in the bottom if that's what you're looking for. Great. Aaron, uh, sorry, Sharon also asks, how often do you need to inspect the brood box? So, so that's a great question. And the answer, like most things in beekeeping, is it depends on where you are in the world. Some places are a lot more demanding. You've got things like the varroa mites. In certain times of the season, you'll need to be getting in there uh, every couple of weeks and doing a, uh, some kind of um, treatment, depending on your strategy, to make sure those mites aren't taking over. Uh, here in Australia, it's a little less demanding. We don't have those varroa mites, so asking um, locals, beekeepers, how often you need to be inspecting is a good idea. Bearing in mind that the more you inspect, the more you learn. So I'd recommend getting in there and and really learning and going through your frames and um, just jump-starting your beekeeping. You don't want to become a beekeeper that just gets a hive and um, just doesn't uh, get into it, doesn't kind of um, start that learning process. Certainly um, you don't want to leave your hive around and uh, disease such as AFB could take hold, spread to other hives, etc. So be a responsible beekeeper, get in there, go through your hives. You want to be going through every frame properly at least a couple of times a year and you'll be getting in there for other reasons just to check on your colony as well. And as said, in those places where you've got the mites, it might be far more often. Steve asks, do you recommend foundation and brood box for a first time beekeeper? The, um, it depends really. Often if you've got a mentor, that's what they'll do. I grew up using wax and wire foundation, and it's certainly the way it's mostly done in the world. And I was very happy to learn the techniques of foundationless beekeeping. The reason being is the bees get to draw the comb themselves, they get to size it for themselves. You don't need to import uh, foreign uh, wax into your hive. Uh, there's said to be health benefits by letting them size the cells and not importing the 
the, the um, wax from other beehives into yours. Um, but actually, it's because I can't be bothered going through that tedious process of wiring and waxing like I used to spend late nights doing. Now I let the bees do it. It's a little bit more work just watching the bees as they grow, making sure they're staying in straight lines. But I far enjoy being in here, making sure the bees are going straight for that, that first few weeks as they're building. Then I do tediously wiring and waxing frames. So it's really up to you. I'd recommend having a go at all sorts of things in beekeeping and seeing what works for you. Melissa asks, I've just introduced a hive to my garden. How long will it take until I can expect honey? Months? So, um, the, it really depends. So the recipe you need to get good honey stores is lots of bees in the hive and that when you open the side windows of the hive, you're seeing a lot of bees over the comb surface. And that needs to co coincide with a good nectar flow. If you just get dribs and drabs of nectar, they'll just consume that and use that for, for, their, for raising their young and you won't get any stores you can harvest. And sometimes you get a whole season goes by and your hive didn't really produce enough stores to then harvest. Other times you can be lucky and your bees will breed up really fast. You get a beautiful nectar flow and in two weeks you can have honey ready to harvest. We certainly hear experiences like that. It would most likely be somewhere in between uh, where you look after your bees for, for, um, for maybe six months or so and then you get this beautiful experience of getting to share some of their honey and harvest it with the flow hive. Mario asks, can I remove excess wax in the brood box and place in the super to help encourage the first time beekeepers and the flow frames? You certainly can, and that can be fun to do. It's something that I don't do personally. I just wait for the bees to naturally breed to the point where they're ready to use the frames. But if you want to hurry things up a little bit, you're getting impatient, or you sense that the bees are a bit stand off to use the flow frames for the first time, good idea. Scrape some wax like we were doing earlier, right off the top of the frames. And you can just use your hive tool and just mash it into the the service of the flow frames. Do it in the window where you can enjoy watching them repurpose that, recycle that wax and use it to, to coat those cells in wax and build the bridges between the cell types. And that can be a good way to get them going for that first time. Ben says, I've been wearing my gloves when doing the inspection. What determines if I can go gloveless? So the, what determines it is you and how comfortable you are um, with with getting a few stings. As you saw, I got a sting on my finger earlier just by putting my hand in the wrong place. So as you get going as a beekeeper, you'll, you'll start to know whether you're comfortable with that or not. And also whether um, your colony is calm enough to, to go without gloves. I have my gloves at the ready in case I open up a hive and for whatever reason they've got uh, aggressive genetics and I really need to put my gloves on to work them without getting multiple stings in my hands. I'm noticing the tone of the hive change here. If I get down close to the hive, you can hear that. They're agitated. So if I start pulling frames out now, if, uh, I'm going to increase the chances of getting stings. So, so I can put my gloves on at this point, or I could add a little bit more smoke and just calm them down a little bit before manipulating the frames some more. Marcello asks, I introduced a new queen five days ago. Is it too soon to check and see if she's okay? He's in Melbourne. Five days is a bit too soon. So they, um, they say you want to leave the queen in there for a couple of weeks before inspecting it. There's, um, there's, there's a few theories around that one is um, you don't want to uh, provide too much disruption to the hive because you don't want the you, you really want the bees to accept that new queen. And it's a little bit touch and go. You're introducing a queen that smells completely different to what they're used to in the hive and uh, comes in the queen cage to, to allow the bees to get used to her smell before she's even released. But even then, you don't want to go manipulating the hive straight away or it might increase the chances that they'll actually knock her off. 
thinking this is a bit of an intruder. So wait a couple of weeks before inspecting. Melinda says that she did a hive inspection yesterday and the bees are building wonky comb. Should she remedy this by replacing the frames? Okay, wonky comb can be a bit annoying. It's something that happens in all types of beekeeping, but um, with foundationless frames, it's pretty more likely to get some wonky comb sometimes. So, what you want to do is push it back into line, and we've got some good videos showing you how to do that in the beekeeper.org if you want to go and have a look there. The, um, the basically, you uh, get your hive tool and you push the wonky bits back into line on the comb guides. And don't be afraid to break the comb a little bit. The bees will fix that up quite quickly and reattach it to the frame. And then once they've got the idea and they're building a few nice straight ones, they'll then tend to follow suit. But the, the idea is catching it early. If it's been left a long time and the bees are completely sideways or, or bridging from one frame to the next frame, what you'll need to do is cut that comb out and in the worst case, rubber band the good sections of brood back into the frame just by using rubber band loops right around the whole frame to hold those comb sections in. The bees will then, while it's temporarily held by the rubber bands, they will connect it again to the comb the, the frame surrounds and away they'll go. So there's a bit of a, a trick you can use if they've really gone wonky and you need to fix it. We've got time for a couple more questions. Aidan says, we just bought a block of land and one of the trees has a hive inside of it. I'm wanting to get into beekeeping. Should I just get someone else to move the bees, buy bees, or can he trap them out and try to relocate them into a flow hive? Okay, the, it's a little more advanced getting bees out of a tree hollow. Getting them out of a wall cavity, you can actually cut the wall cavity apart and rubber band sections of the brood into your hive and make sure you've got the queen and so on and start that way. Out of a wall, out of a tree, without cutting that tree down, the, um, you, you can only use a, a few techniques that are um, a bit more advanced, but you may be able to do it. So here, if you are the more adventurous type, here's what I would do. I would get a, a tube going from the um, tree, if you can get a seal around where they come out. And I would then get a brood box like this with some frames already in it. And I would make a hole for the tube right into the box. So the bees are having to use this as their exit path. Then I would go and get a, a um, cattle tick um, ear tag and throw that into the cavity inside the tree. And what will happen is they, they, um, it won't kill them, but it will annoy them sufficiently to vacate the tree hollow and, and into your box. So that's one technique. Of course, if you're in Europe and um, that's a naturally existing wild colony, you don't want to go driving them out of the tree hollow. In other countries, they are a introduced species and it would seem like a fine thing to do to drive the bees out of that um, tree hollow and into your hive. So another thing you can do um, is make a cone inside that pipe. So imagine this clear pipe coming out of the tree and you do what a bit like they do when they're crabbing, making those crab pots. So a cone of fly wire inside the, the pipe will make it like a one-way valve for the bees. So the bees will be able to go through easily one way, but a bit harder coming back the other way. And that means you get lots and lots of bees in your box outside and less and less inside the tree. And um, so those techniques can have success, but it will take you a while and it will be a bit of an adventure. If you embark on it, I'd love to know how you go. Thank you very much for, for asking all your great questions. If you've got more, put them in the comments below. And also, if, you, if you're interested to check out some, some uh, beekeeping training that's designed to take you from square one right through to uh, a confident beekeeper, then have a look at the beekeeper.org, where there's experts from around the world contributing to an online beekeeping course. Thank you very much for watching, and tune in again same time next week, and we'll have some interesting things to show you, and I'm here to answer your questions.